So I want to remind everybody that you are a security investor, which means that you buy individual stocks and in some cases sell individual stocks short. But the natural question many people would have for a value investor right now is this, after a 10% or almost 10% sell-off, to the degree that you look at the market and decide whether it's cheap or expensive, is it cheap? Sure, so we actually value all the businesses in the S&P 500 bottoms up, uh, and we have good data going back to 1990. So we can actually contextualize where do we stand today according to the way we value you know, our measures of absolute and relative value that we use and we apply them consistently over the 28 years. And right now we're in the 22nd percentile towards expensive over the last 28 years, meaning the market's been cheaper 78% of the time, more expensive 22% of the time. Now this isn't a projection, but we can go back in time and look from this valuation percentile in the past, what's happened over the next year or two. And? And uh, markets up four to six percent over the next year, ten to twelve over the next two. So subnormal, meaning during that twenty-eight year period, market was up about ten percent a year, uh, and we're expensive or above average. So uh, four to six is is closer to what's happened in the past over the next year. The market has repriced from its peak PE by about four four and a half times. Do you see that as healthy? You know, we don't really look at PE, we're really looking at cash flows, okay. and so we're pretty consistent uh, about that. And so market's gotten somewhat cheaper. I mean, it was down uh, maybe towards the end of September, it was probably down about the 14th percentile. Now it's back at the 22nd, so it's dropped, but it's not cheap. Uh, but then again, how, what could happen from here, you know, in the 22nd percentile with expected returns of 4 to 6%? One way to get back, and no guarantee that we get back to those expected returns of 10% or so, but one way you could get back there is if the market fell 18 or 20% tomorrow, the expected returns going forward from there would get closer to 10% a year. Uh, but that doesn't have to happen because if the market just under-earned, meaning had subnormal returns of 4 to 6% in each of the next three years, then three years from now with a normal earnings trajectory, we'd also be back to a 10% expected return. So it's really not helpful for me to know uh, what's going to happen in the next few months, but it is helpful from an investment standpoint of, uh, you know, what are the prospects for the market in general and, and, and how exposed when you're, if you're really uh, taking portfolio exposure to the market, you know, where should you be? Joel, tech stocks, and in particular the FANGs, have led this recent sell-off. How cheap would those stocks have to get to appeal to a value investor like you? You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the things that we're short are generally trading at 50 or 100 times earnings uh, or losing money. Those are your sort of choices of the things that we're going to be shorting. So within that group will often be certain types of FANG stocks. Uh, if they're not earning a lot of money yet and people are pricing it on 2024 earnings uh, and they have a lot of high hopes in, involved there. And we're not really opining. We own hundreds of stocks on the long side and hundreds of stocks mm -hmm. on the short side. So the bucket of companies that are trading at 50 or 100 times pre-tax free cash flows or losing money. Historically, that's the world's worst investment strategy. There will be some winners within that group, and you'll actually know their names because they won. But I call that the tyranny of the anecdote, okay? It's really the world's worst investment strategy as a, as a group, but some of them will win, and you'll know their names because they won. But as a group, it's a bad investment strategy. So we're really concentrating on companies that have 7 8 9% free cash flow yields in a 3% interest rate environment. Uh, and while some of those may be priced uh, cheaply because the, the people are a little concerned about the future, even though they're earning lots of cash flow now, we try to stick to companies that are gushing free cash flow, huge returns on capital, meaning they deploy their uh, capital well. That avoids some of the value traps from traditional value. And so I think that brings up the point, we don't really think of value as low price book, low price sales investing. We're actually valuing businesses based on cash flows like a private equity investor mm -hmm. would. And so if you're trying to figure out what a company's worth and, and buy it for less at a bigger discount, that will 
never go out of favor, even if tradition, you know, value as defined by Russell or Morningstar, which is low price book, low price sales investing, that may or may not go uh, stay in vogue. It may be out of favor sometimes, in favor, may not even outperform the market uh, going forward. That doesn't mean that much to me because those are sort of have been correlations that have worked with more than your fair share of companies that are out of favor. I don't imagine they'll, could, they'll come back at some point, uh, but we're actually valuing businesses based on cash flows, and that's what stocks are, ownership shares of businesses. There are early indications in recent weeks that maybe there's a shift, that maybe the premium investors have given to growth stocks is coming off, and perhaps they're beginning to appreciate value once again. It's been about a decade since they genuinely appreciated value, if not perhaps a bit longer. What are you seeing? Yeah, so um, while I say we're not traditional value investors and, and we're usually categorized by, let's say, a Russell or a Morningstar as blend, as War Warren Buffett would say, growth and value are tied at the hip. That's part of valuation. Uh, so they put us in blend, not traditional value. But when growth is really going, and these are the companies priced on hope and, and what's going to happen in 2024, 2025, when those are doing really well, uh, they're probably uh, not going to love what we're doing as much. In other words, so we would rhyme a little more with traditional value. And so in those type of uh, frothy markets, that's not our market. But those don't last forever. Uh, prices have gotten pretty high. And like I said, that doesn't mean that the FANG stocks or some of the names that you're familiar with won't do well or they won't meet the expectations that people think. It's just that as a group, uh, the growth group uh, where people just pay up for you know, expected growth over the next five years, uh, that's probably, as you suggest, uh, uh, have been a little frothy. I would expect that to come back to earth. What uh, do you think the catalyst for that is going to be? Rising interest rates? I mean, the real answer is I don't know. Uh, I would just say that it always happens. In other words, if the pendulum swings too much one way, uh, there'll be, you know, just like we had a correction in October, that could happen. Things in general are more expensive than usual, but like I said, it could play out in a lot of different ways. Market could fall 18 or 20 percent tomorrow, or it could just under-earn at 4 to 6 percent a year for a few years. And that's the way it levels off, meaning lower returns than, than what you people have become. Uh, but surely th some things must confuse you if you evaluate the market based on the things that you've observed in history, the degree to which, for example, companies with bad balance sheets haven't been punished. Yes, yeah, so basically there's a, there's a reflexive component to that. One thing I didn't mention that uh, the Russell 2000, which is the small cap universe, that's in the sixth percentile towards expensive, meaning it's been cheaper 94% of the time. And when it's been here in the past year, forward returns have been about flat. So depending on what companies we're talking about, that is super expensive. That should come back over time. It's usually not a good idea to lose money or buy things at 100 times pre-tax free cash flows. Just bad idea. Joel, I want to ask you a question about factors. You're not a systematic investor, but I've wondered to myself if there's any way you would ever embrace systematic value investing. And the reason I ask the question is because I know that you teach your students at Columbia to look at a security the way that they would consider buying a house. Well, what if you were buying the neighborhood? Wouldn't you evaluate all the houses in the neighborhood on an aggregate basis and decide whether one neighborhood was cheap relative to another neighborhood being expensive and maybe the cheap neighborhood on aggregate was worth buying? Maybe selling houses in well, aggregate in the expensive neighborhood? Because I hear you. Because over call, time, that's worked. Right. So the statistics suggest that value is a factor. Yeah. Outperforms growth, it outperforms momentum, it outperforms size, it outperforms everything. Right, but the way people describe value factor as low price book, low price sales, I have no... Well, there are many ways to slice it. Right, but the way that they're categorized by, let's say, a Russell or a Morningstar is low price book, low price sales. And to me, that's not a factor that we look at, okay? We're looking at cash flow. So what happens Would to that... Would you consider doing it on cash flow? I do. That's what we do. We you value screen, businesses. Sure? sure, we're buying the cheapest, and, you know, you brought up the house analogy, so... You know, if you're buying a house, it's pretty simple questions. They're asking a million dollars. Your job is to figure out whether it's a good deal or not. So one question you might ask is, if I rented it out and I could get seventy or $80,000 a year net of my expenses and interest rates are 3%, does that sound pretty good? How cheap is it relative to similar houses and all houses in all neighborhoods? So we look at a company. We say, how cheap is it relative to companies in the same industry? How cheap is it relative to all companies I can choose from? How cheap is it relative to how it's been priced over history relative to the market? These are measures of absolute relative value that anyone would use to value 
value any earning asset. We can't value gold or Bitcoin that way, <laughs> and that's why we pass, okay? We don't <laughs> value, but earning assets, uh, there are standard ways that everyone would value them, and you know, if you don't go crazy and you're very disciplined about it, there's plenty of opportunities always.